Welcome to Humans Behind Art. Today's guest is Lidewey Meyer. She's a videographer from the Netherlands and you've probably seen some of her work as she's the one who created this. <laughs> We talked about her work as a videographer in a time when everything suddenly moves online. Falling, a video dance piece she created, as well as what you should pay attention to when you want to bring your art onto the screen. Before we start, a big thank you to our supporters on Patreon. If you want to become a supporter to Kapta Levy as well, there will be more information at the end of the video or in the video description. Make sure to subscribe to Kapta Levy and Let's start into the interview. All right, well, my name is Lido Ai, or Lido for short, and uh, I'm from the Netherlands. And uh, right now I live in Utrecht with my boyfriend. And uh, yeah, I'm a videographer. So, how are you connected actually with Cap de la Ville? As You've done some stuff with us in the past. Um, it's not a secret. So, let's talk a little bit how that this connection happened and uh, what you did and what you're doing. Well, um, I uh, am a good friend of Dani, and uh, that's how I know Katalavi. Um, I uh, got to know him as uh, as my dance teacher um, via a mutual friend, and uh, yeah, from teacher he became a friend, and uh, yeah, so. What's the first thing I did for Cap de la Vie? I'm not even sure. I think it was, um, um, well, I think the first video of mine that was on the channel was Falling, the video that I made uh, <laughs> during lockdown of myself. And um, after that, I made the introduction video for Cap de la Vie, which is a combination of different videos on the channel. And then um, a project I did with Sara and Dani, a uh, fire project got posted and I made the um, uh, two dance videos, one with Dani and one with Dani and Marike, which was uh, an initiative of mine. So I actually, <laughs> like I checked the channel today and I was like, oh, actually there's quite some videos. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so before diving deeper into the, um, the projects that you did yourself, um, how did you actually become a videographer? Like, where did you study and what was your motivation to, to go into that kind of field of work? Yeah, it was actually, um, it just kind of happened. <laughs> when I was 18, I, uh, when I was done with high school, I actually wanted to become a professional dancer. Mm, so I auditioned also for Godarts, uh, where Dani is, and for a, another school in the Netherlands, but I didn't get accepted. <laughs> I mean, like in hindsight, it's very obvious that I didn't get accepted. It was a bit naive because I was just like this dancer. I danced a couple times a week, but all the people that auditioned were people that had like dance high schools and were like much, much better than me. <laughs> so I quickly, um, yeah, forgot about that dream. And I thought, okay, so what am I going to do now? Because that was like my plan A and I didn't really have a plan B and I had to like um, sign up for an education. So then I just decided to study theater, film and television studies um, because I liked movies and watching TV. <laughs> and uh, I was just like, well, if I like it, I like it. If I don't, then I'll just stop. But I did like it. So uh, I finished the the bachelor of that studies, but during during that studies I was like, mm, I mean I like I like it, but it was very theoretical and analytical and looking at other people's work and there were only a couple of subjects where you had to create videos yourself and during those videos like during those. Uh, at times I was like, okay, <laughs> making it myself is much better than analyzing other people's work. So I didn't do a master's degree. I, uh, I uh, started doing internships at television and movie sets in the Netherlands. And uh, yeah, I got some uh, experience being a production assistant and being a 
a director's assistant. I did that for about two years, I think. And um, after that, I noticed that it was not, also that was not really for me because it was like a job where you had to, like it, it, it was a job that wouldn't allow you to have any uh, personal life. <laughs> you just have to be on set like, um, yeah, 14 hours a day. And I was just like, okay, no, this is not for me. And um, so at a certain point, uh, some people in uh, like some friends and family started to ask me if I could make some videos for them. And uh, yeah, that's when I noticed that I really liked to do that. And uh, I noticed that I could also make some money with it. So I was like, hmm, maybe I should do this. <laughs> so yeah, I, and more and more, I, I just started to make uh, videos and uh, I was able to make a living out of it. So that's actually how I ended up here. <laughs> yeah, so I think I've been doing that for about three, four years now. Now, right now, obviously, a lot of performers that are usually performing on the stage need a new place to uh, show themselves and are trying to do things online and realize quickly, okay, there is a big difference between how I do things on stage and how I do things in video. So there is a very different language that needs to be used. Where are there the big differences for you? Well, I think the biggest difference between um, being on stage and being on video is that on stage you only have one chance <laughs> to do it. It's live and with the videos I make, I, I don't really do live streams or something like that. I, yeah, so it's not live and you can do multiple takes. Uh, so for instance, the, the fire project uh, with Dani and Sara was, we did a lot of takes of the same dance and um, uh, I combined them and I chose the best parts of the takes, um, yeah, to make the best uh, possible results. I mean, they did they did choose one audio track, um, but the video was yeah was a combination of different takes. So I think with video there is a maybe less pressure, mm, but also I think a stage performance is more raw in that sense because you can't uh, yeah you can't redo things so if there's something not perfect then then that's it <laughs> and that also has something nice i think you say you're doing this in three or four years now already what is the the process for you when a client comes to you and says okay hey i would like to have a video what uh, what is the process to make that happen well, um, at first, of course, we discuss what um, if they already have a like a precise idea of what they want because it's it's very different. Uh, some clients are like, yeah, uh, I want a video of my school, do whatever, <laughs> uh, and and in that case, uh, I get to do yeah, I have to think about okay, what what how should I portray this in what way? And of course, they will give me some some key words that need to be in it or some subjects that need to be covered. But uh, yeah, there's clients like that. And there's also clients that are very specific and they know exactly what they want. Um, so first we have this talk, what do you want? Um, and then we set a date for the video. And then um, um, Sometimes I rent extra cameras or like yesterday I had a shoot with uh, Bibi Milanese um, and um, yeah, we, we had to shoot something where I probably am not able to use different parts of different takes because there's a lot of improvisation. She's a singer um, and a piano player. Um, so I thought, okay, I, have, I need more cameras for this to have more angles for the specific take they're going to choose. And um, so we have the filming day and then, um, yeah, and then the editing starts and the editing is uh, what make, what takes most time. Um, yeah, I think it takes about probably four times more time than the actual filming, something like that. And then I send it to the client and then they check it and give me feedback and then I change things if they want and then I send it back and then 
yeah, <laughs> that's it. <laughs> Now, you mentioned earlier already that um, during lockdown you also made a project yourself called Falling that was also shared on Cap de la Vie. How did uh, this come together? What was the idea you started with and um, how did that go? The idea started uh, because Dani asked uh, friends and acquaintances to, to make a video of yourself dancing to share on Cap de la Vie. And I thought, okay, this is my chance, you know, <laughs> because, um, yeah, I, I am a dancer. I mean, not professionally, but I, I just love to dance. I've danced since I was six or something. And um, uh, yeah, and I'm a videographer, so I thought, okay, <laughs> this is it. Um, but yeah, it was quarantine, so I didn't, uh, I thought, okay, let's do it inside the house. And um, <laughs> I thought, okay. Uh, we have one wall in our house that is a nice color. <laughs> Let's do it in front of that. But our bed is right underneath this wall. Um, so I don't think you can see it in the video, but I'm on the bed. And um, I was just, I didn't really have an idea what kind of video it, it had to be. I, I just thought, let's let's see what I can do here. And well, while I was filming, I was like, okay, I noticed a lot of these moves involve falling because normally like on the floor you can't really fall like you can fall on a bed so a lot yeah a lot of moves were me falling in some way um, which yeah it was kind of uh, it just happened <laughs> you know and then uh, when I was editing I I yeah I just saw that it was a very cool effect to make it slow motion and I chose this song from uh, uh, from the internet that you could use for free and then my boyfriend who's a, a professional saxophone player um, played the saxophone over over this music to make it a bit more interesting <laughs> and uh, yeah and then I sent it to Danny and I was like here you go <laughs> now that stage is not an option at the moment do you notice there a rise in demand for for you but in general for videographers um, that people are asking for okay I don't have a stage let's do something online but let's use a videographer for for this um, not really I mean I did the video for uh, Sara which was uh, instead of her actual um, end of end of uh, studies performance um, so that was kind of required for her to do it. But I think a lot of artists, um, because they don't, they cannot perform and they cannot, um, they don't have a stage. They also don't have money. <laughs> 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 so, yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so I don't really have a lot of more clients, um, like artists. Um, but there, yeah, I did have other jobs that I wouldn't have had uh, if it wasn't for Corona. <laughs> like, for instance, I do a lot for a museum um, and they needed this video showing how they, um, how they, uh, how do you say, how they arrange things during COVID time in the museum, you know, like, uh, yeah, I mean, we have sanitary things here and uh, we clean everything. And so it, like it generates extra work. Um, but not really, um, for me at least, not more artists. Yeah, I, I see. Um, I'm wondering then though, okay, museums that um, have more money as they are a bigger institution and often state funded as well, or having other private people with big wallets behind it, um, to then hire videographers and make videos and bring not only their sanitary concepts online and make commercial, but as well to bring their, um, their exhibitions online as people right now, again, I'm not sure how it is in Holland right now, can't go into museums. Yeah. Yeah, actually. Yeah. So the museum I work for a lot is called the Van Abbe Museum in Eindhoven. And, um, yeah, exactly what you're saying. They, they, um, 
use the video that I made of the new exhibition uh, online and they have like this virtual tour through the museum and you can click on things and then you can see my video um, or one of my videos and they also recently contacted me that they they want to uh, put out more online content of the video like curators uh, talking about the um, um, the archive of the museum like stuff you normally cannot visit um, so yeah uh, there actually uh, there is more uh, online content now that sounds really interesting as well I see uh, as well a chance in in the restrictions that we have right now and I'm always a bit bipolar about this trend of putting everything online um, because okay, I'm, I still love the stage and I love the direct interaction with the audience. But at the same time, okay, to go to a theater, to watch a show, you have to pay money and not everybody has money. So to create a bigger audience that otherwise you wouldn't be able to reach through online content is a, is a beautiful way. And how is it? In, in the Netherlands at the moment, because I would imagine at least that for bigger theaters, they could actually use their their buildings and um, their their existing audiences as well to to maintain what was before happening on stage and to bring it into the internet. But from my own experience, I see a lot. Okay, theaters are closed, but there is not so much happening inside either and artists are kind of on their own and everybody fights their own fight and um, it's a pity I think. Yeah, I think you're right. I think I don't really see a lot of um, videos but I do see a lot of live streams. Um, so I think that's what's happening um, a lot but I uh, yeah I, ne I never did a, a live stream and also when people like some people ask me if I wanted to do or wanted to record a live stream, but I, yeah, I don't really feel like moving in that direction. So, yeah. <laughs> I mean, if you have a live stream, it becomes again, okay, you cannot play as much uh, in the medium as you can do if you film it and then edit afterwards, right? No, no. But I do think um, like a live stream, like what we talked to in the beginning, it give it will give more feel of the um, of the rawness of a performance because uh, yeah because of the the fact that it's live like a real performance. You mentioned earlier on uh, during your studies um, all this analyzing of videos and works of other people, um, and that you didn't really enjoy that part of the studies. Well, I mean, I did enjoy it, but I didn't enjoy enjoy it as much as creating myself. Yeah, I, I just, I didn't like it enough to also do a master's and like, I don't know, become a, like this um, film critic or something, <laughs> you know? When you are watching videos now, do you, are you able to look at them neutrally or are you still so brainwashed in a way that you're looking for the details okay how did they do a certain thing yeah i think it's different for uh, films and videos like m like movies in the cinema i can i can easily like turn off this this work glasses you know if uh, especially if it's um uh, if it's well made you know i i just i just watch it um but I think um, because of my studies and because of my work, I do notice if it's like, um, how do you say, if it's like really nice, <laughs> you know, I can, I can see it if it's like quality, you know, um, if they do, like, I think I'm more uh, tuned into if they have a really nice cinematography, you know, maybe at the end of a movie, I'll, I'll say something like, oh, the lighting or was really nice or like the, 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 the positioning of the care, whatever. I think maybe I can, I'm more attuned to that than someone that doesn't do my work. But I think mostly 
um, videos online, uh, I cannot really watch without noticing how how it was made. Um, yeah, but I I don't mind. I like it. <laughs> it it makes me uh, it makes me uh, um, more happy if I see something that's made well. <laughs> no. Are there in those online videos that you just talked about a few? Are there like common mistakes that um, that happen over and over again? Um, do you see any regularity in things where you can tell, okay, somebody made that with the best intention, but obviously didn't know enough about? Yeah, <laughs> I think lighting is very important. Um... So for instance, like right now, <laughs> in the preparation for this interview, it's like, okay, I'm gonna sit in front of a window. Um, I'm gonna be like some white behind me. And like uh, there's enough space <laughs> above me and stuff like that. You know, sometimes you'll see people and I'll, yeah, I put my laptop higher up. So it's like eye level. So these kinds of things, are things that probably other people won't really think about or I mean you look really nice <laughs> yeah um, but yeah oftentimes with especially now during corona um, you see people like like this or I don't know just but yeah in in other videos um, um, yeah it's mostly framing I think like cutting cutting off people's uh, arms or <laughs> heads or whatever uh, ha not having enough space around someone or having too much um, I think that's probably something that yeah you can immediately see that it wasn't really thought about I think that's like the main feedback as well that like from what I hear from you right now to towards all the uh, the artists and people that are now trying to create their own online presence to okay think about everything it's it's a completely different thing and you have to ask a lot of questions that you're not used to asking but at the same time okay there is a lot of resources online to about lighting about framing yeah and of course it's really it's almost also unfair because if you are not a professional videographer, you probably also don't have a professional camera. Um, yes. And of course, gear does really matter. Um, if you have a good camera, then probably it will immediately look better, even if you have the same framing. Um, if you have the right lenses, you can film even if it's not that light. You know, even if you don't have the right light, it still looks good. And um, for instance, the camera that I have, uh, like the lens that I bought, it's it's especially good for uh, uh, low light situations, and it makes sure that you have like a, a blurred background, and um, so like the that's something you can really see in the in the, the falling video, I think. Like, yeah, um, the quality of the gear <laughs> also makes it better. <laughs> So yeah, that's a that's an unfair advantage that you have as a professional. Like, what are the big questions that we should ask ourselves uh, when doing something online? Because you mentioned before, okay, hiring a videographer costs money. Most of us don't have a lot of money right now to to pay for that. Um, but what are the the key questions you should ask yourself when you make an online video? Don't make it too long. <laughs> Keep it short because people on the internet don't have any attention span at all. So I would say, yeah, make short videos. <laughs> uh, or I don't know. I mean, it's diff difficult because I mean, I watch a lot of 20 minute videos on YouTube. Um, so it depends, I guess. Um, where you want to distribute or what is your target audience because if you're going to post it to Facebook or Instagram then make it short if you're going to post it to YouTube but yeah it can be longer um, so yeah think about your length um, think about um, 
so a lot a lot of online videos people watch without sound you know scrolling having their sound off and being on the bus whatever so think about what what can someone that doesn't hear the video take from it so maybe think about subtitling it or think about using text in your video um what else audio <laughs> so if people listen <laughs> make sure your audio is nice <laughs> yeah uh, so um yeah that, i mean yeah it really depends what kind of video you want to make but also like even cheap microphones are already pretty good so if you have some money maybe buy a microphone <laughs> that's like maybe you have like these lav mics that you can clip on for 50 euros and then you can just plug them into your phone and you use a recorder app and it sounds pretty good <laughs> so um yeah what else um make it fast i think like if it's or also like um on instagram and in your stories don't start <laughs> this is a very specific thing but don't start with like um a black screen and some text like if you want text in the video that's that's nice but put something in front that's like the subject of the video so if it's a dance video like start with a, a move and then do the title because if people see like black and text they're like they're already gone <laughs> so start with what the video is about immediately and then if you want to give context do that after the first three seconds <laughs> yeah something like that now uh we already talked in the beginning your your connection with Capdella v and all those things um but uh, in the stuff of Capdella v that you are watching yourself and uh seeing what is happening on youtube other things that you notice, okay, there is something that they can do better. Any any feedback essentially that you have for us in the way that we work? Um, well, I think you're really doing a great job at posting regularly, which I think is probably the most important thing. Like just pump out that content, <laughs> um, both on Instagram and on YouTube. But yeah, I think it's really uh, impressive. How, how much you guys post so keep it up and other than that um yeah i don't know actually i think you're doing great <laughs> nice that's good to hear <laughs> um in that case uh is there anything that you still want to share yourself anything any questions that you have yourself anything that you want to get rid of Subscribe to Kaptalavi. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Okay, nice. Thank you for watching. You've made it until the end of this video, so I assume you enjoyed what you saw. Share all your thoughts, feelings and opinions with us in the comment section below. And don't forget to like the video, subscribe to Kaptalavi and activate the bell to always stay up to date on all of our content. As you enjoy our work, you should check out our Patreon. By becoming a Patreon, you not only support our work, but you also gain special access to the full-length interviews, early access to all of our regular content, behind-the-scenes access to all of our Cap Tel Aviv original productions, and you gain access to all of us. Patreon is the living room of our community, where you can get to know other creatives and start new exciting collaborations. I see you over there or else next week. We bring you new artists every Friday and new interviews every Sunday.